Hey guys, and welcome to video one for chapter 28. For chapter 28, we're going to be talking about Islamic empires. Uh, we're going to be talking about Islamic empires in the early modern era. You know, Islamic empires had started almost immediately after the creation of the faith in the seventh century. They you know, went out and conquered the Arabian Peninsula and North Africa, you know, up through uh, Persia and, you know, basically the entire Middle East. But by this time, there were three major empires in the Muslim world. You see them here on the map. You have the Ottoman Empire. You have the Safavid Empire and you have the Mughal Empire. Okay, so the Middle East, Persia, and India. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, they're sometimes also referred to as the gunpowder uh, empires because, as you can see from the pictures, they each had very strong militaries. They also had very elaborate government bureaucracies and they made use of emerging technologies such as cannons and other uh, weapons of warfare. Uh, so the first one we're going to be talking about is the Ottoman Empire. Now, Ottomans were Turks. All right? We talked about them, or we originally talked about them a couple of chapters ago. And Turks migrated to the Middle East around the 10th century, and they quickly became a dominant force in the old Abbasid Caliphate. You know, the original Turks in the region, the Seljuks, were eventually displaced by the Ottomans. Now, Ottomans are named for the founder of the dynasty, Osman Bey. Uh, you can see the Turks, they love their big hats, big puffy hats. And his dynasty, it lasted from its founding in 1289 until the empire was dissolved in 1923. So the Ottoman dynasty ruled for a very long time. And Osman and later uh, Ottoman sultans, they encouraged their followers to be Ghazi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ghazi are religious, uh, I'm sorry, Muslim religious warriors. Uh, they were the sword of Allah, and they should not fear death in the service of Allah. Now, this warrior culture aided them in their rapid military expansion. They quickly expanded into Anatolia, which is current-day Turkey, and took advantage of the crumbling Byzantine Empire, which was shrinking day by day. Uh, and they uh, were able to defeat them by using very effective military tactics. They used a professional cavalry, right, on horseback, uh, and an elite force that was stabbed through forced recruitment. They forced conquered boys, particularly Christian boys, that was their favorite one, to enter into military service at a very young age. And they were indoctrinated into service and uh, taught to be completely loyal to the Sultan. Now, the best of these forces, the most elite of them, were the Janissaries. Janissaries were extremely loyal to the, uh, the Sultan and were known as an elite fighting force. Right? They were the special forces. They were the military commanders. Now, a specific sultan who exemplified this conquering spirit was Mehmed the Conqueror. As you can tell by his name, it pretty much says it all. He captured Constantinople in 1453, right, when he uh, then renamed it Istanbul and made it the capital of the Ottoman Empire. And Mehmed was the first Ottoman sultan who moved beyond being just a Ghazi warrior and became a true emperor in the sense of an absolute ruler. Uh, he ruled over a highly centralized absolute monarchy. Uh, and Ottoman expansion reached its height during the rule of Suleiman. Oh, there's a picture of Mehmed. And there you have Suleiman. Again, both, uh, they love their puffy hats. Let me move me out of the way a little bit so you can get a better look at Mehmed. Um, now, Suleiman reigned from 1520 to 1566. And then, uh, his empire was very, very uh, big. You know, you look at it in this one. Reached all the way into Western Europe. Okay, you see Vienna here, the capital of Austria. Ottoman forces laid siege to Vienna, and it really scared Western European kings and, and leaders that the Turks, the Saracens, right, these infidels who were right at their doorstep. Um, now, aside from having uh, his Janissaries and his army, he also built up a powerful navy to control the Mediterranean and even trade routes in the Indian Ocean uh, and, you know, gave challenge to emerging European military might, such as against the British and the Dutch and so forth. Now, the second empire was the Safavid Empire. This empire started from somewhat humble beginnings with its founder, Shah Ishmael, who reigned from 1501 to 1524. Now, for propaganda purposes, Ishmael claimed to be a descendant of the Sufi leader Safi al-Din. His family claimed the site of Safi al-Din's tomb as their home. This gave them the name Safavids. Excuse me. Uh, the Safavids changed their specific religious preferences from Sufi to uh, Shiite. All right, they did this to appeal to the people they ruled. They eventually settled on a branch of Shiite Islam known as Twelver Shiism. Twelver, it's a very interesting one. It's also still officially the uh, branch of Islam, uh, the official branch of Islam in Iran today. Um, Anyway, in this one, there was, uh, Twelvers believed that there had been 12 infallible, meaning without fault, imams. All right, imams were Shiite religious leaders. Ali, Muhammad's son-in-law, was the original. 
Uh, and then it was followed by you know, his descendants and successors. Uh, now, Ishmael claimed to be the 12th imam. Right? According to 12 or Shiism legend, the 12th imam went into hiding and his uh, identity was never known. So Ishmael claiming to be the 12th gave him a form of divine right. You know, because uh, Shiite Muslims believe that the imams trace their lineage back to the Prophet Muhammad. Now, while this was a more extreme belief uh, than a lot of more mainstream Muslims would have bought into, it actually appealed to Turkish nomads who often gave divine status to their commanders. And made them even more loyal to the Shah. They made them devoutly loyal to the Shah. Safavids made an interesting blend of Shiism and Turkish military traditions in this way. Now, adopting Shiism put them in conflict with the Ottomans, who were Sunni Muslims, and this rivalry culminated in the Battle of Chaldaran in 1514. The Ottomans deployed cannons, thousands of Janissaries uh, armed with guns, and the Safavids chose not to use gunpowder weapons for this battle because they deemed them unreliable, and also they felt that they were unmanly, so they wanted to stick with old-school manly weapons like swords and axes and bows and arrows. Uh, they also believed that the Shah made them invincible, so they charged headlong into the Ottoman cannons and guns. And you can imagine how that went. Okay, so they were defeated very soundly. And this defeat led to some significant changes for later Safavid Shahs. They returned to a more traditional Persian system of governments with bureaucracies and so forth and adapted a less extreme form of Shiism. But as I said, Twelver Shiism is still the official ideology of Iran even today. And the most prominent of these later Shahs was Shah Abbas the Great who ruled from 1588 to 1629 and could rock one heck of a mustache. He reformed the government and the military, such as actually using gunpowder, uh, which was smart. Uh, he encouraged foreign trade, and he expanded the size of the empire. Right, you can see how current day Iran is pretty much completely within it, but today a little bit into what would be uh, Iraq, and then uh, you know closer uh, to is somewhat into Afghanistan, even close to the border of what today would be Pakistan, was all part of the Safavid Empire back then. Now, the final Islamic empire of this era was the Mughal Empire. Now, the Mughal was in northern India, right? You see the different phases of it, of uh, three different emperors. I'll go through them in a second. Uh, it was founded by a foreigner, okay? So there was the uh, leaders of the dynasty were not ethnically Indian. They were, again, more Central Asian Turkish. Uh, and his name was Zahir al-Din Muhammad, but he was better known as Babur, meaning tiger. He was a Turk from Central Asia who claimed to be descended from both Genghis Khan and Tamerlane. And the amount of wives and children that both those men had made it possible that there was some of their genetics running through Babur. Uh, in any event, he invaded northern India in 1523. Uh, wasn't sure about setting up a, a permanent re uh, residency there at first. First, but using gunpowder weapons, he eventually captured Delhi here at right, the capital of the Delhi Sultanate in 1526, as you see the a map. And this established uh, control of his new empire. And his empire went from the Ganges Plain all the way and included Kabul, which today is in current day Afghanistan. So it stretched over what today would be actually three different borders, India, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, now, while he laid the foundations of the empire, it really took form under his grandson, Akbar, who ruled from 1556 to 1605. Akbar consolidated power through authoritarian rule and expanded the size of the empire. All right, you see how all this was Akbar, you know, the kind of the orange uh, shade. Extended a little bit farther down into the Deccan, completely controlled the Indus Valley and the Ganges Valley, so controlled the ports that go into the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea. Um, but what he was best known for was for religious tolerance. He granted more rights to Hindus, and he also encouraged what he called the divine faith. The divine faith was a, a syncretic religion that focused on the emperor as a ruler for all groups. Didn't matter whether they were Muslim or Hindus. You know, Hindus didn't have to pay the tax anymore. They were allowed higher positions in government. He figured that it just made sense because the vast majority of people down here in southern India are Hindu. Right? Muslims were the minorities, so why not just keep them happy? Why not just keep them content? Uh, well, later successors of his wouldn't follow this policy, um, but they would expand even farther down into India. And the empire reached its height under Aurangzeb, who ruled from 1659 to 1707. All right, so he's the third one up here, Aurangzeb, and you see how he controlled almost the entire subcontinent except for the bottom tip of it and the island of Ceylon, which is today Sri Lanka. 
Now, by the end of his rule, the empire was very, very large, but it was in constant problems. You see, he gave in to pressure from conservative Muslims, and he abandoned the religious tolerance policies of Akbar. This, as you can imagine, led to an awful lot of conflict between Hindus and Muslims, and the constant rebellion ended up destabilizing much of the area and let it open for control from foreigners, such as the British, would, would, uh, who would increase their control through the 1700s into the 1800s. Okay, so there's a brief overview of the three Islamic empires. In the next one, we're going to talk about society in the different empires.